Design Notes is a show about creative work and what it teaches us. I'm your host, Liam Spradlin. Each episode, we talk with people from unique creative fields to discover what inspires and unites us in our practice. At the moment, most design is is about hiding complexity. It's about making it easier for people to do things, making everything as essentially thoughtless as possible. When what we really, really, really need to do more than anything is like think about this. Not to be overwhelmed by it, not to be overcome by it, not to try and solve it, but simply not to sort of panic every time we encounter complexity in various ways. That interview was taped at this year's Google Design Span Conference in Helsinki. I'm your guest host, Aaron Lammer. I got to talk to artist and writer James Bridal, whose work is heavily concerned with surveillance. Doing um, a huge amount of work around surveillance, and it kind of intensely sensitized myself to it, to the point where when I walk around London and other heavily surveilled cities now, I kind of feel it as like kind of prickling on my shoulder blades. James and I talked about his thoughts on onboarding the world's next billion users. This phrase that's been used several times at this conference already, which is the next billion users. How, we, how do we onboard them onto the systems that we have at present? That's, that's not going to be what's going to happen. Uh, the next billion users are going to be very hot and very wet and pretty pissed off. And their needs are going to be radically different to the last billion users. And so thinking through what it really means to look outside this kind of, um, this bubble of, of what design's supposed to do, because yeah, our, our current engagement with technology is, is radically unsustainable. Design Notes is put out by Google Design. You can find out more about Google Design's podcasts at design.google slash podcasts. Welcome, uh, James Bridal. Good morning. Good morning. You have a, uh, a new book. It's called The New Dark Age. When, how long has how long it been since the book came out? It's three or four months now. Three or four, okay. It must be difficult to do a book on this topic because there's the constant chance with technology that... Um, technology will surge past the concerns of the book. Was that like something you were thinking about while you were writing it? I was thinking about it a little bit. I mean, I've worked in publishing, so I have some sense of the lead times. And there's, there's, there's always what feels like an incredible gulf between finishing writing and this thing actually coming out in public. But at the same time, the book is slightly about time and about slightly resisting that, that fear of being kind of overtaken by it. I, I don't think there's anything in there that, that was no longer relevant by the time the book came out. And in fact, though, because of the material it was looking at, there was stuff that maybe seemed, you know, a bit out there when it was written and actually turned out to be incredibly important. So, for example, I, I, in the book, I picked up quite a lot on some of Carol Cadwallader's early writing about Cambridge Analytica, which she was putting out there in 2017. But that stuff didn't really break in the mainstream until pretty much around the time the book was publishing. You write a lot about how technology has outpaced our understanding of it and technology um, often does very little to inform humanity about what it is, what its intentions are. What, is, what are the ways that you try to understand it? What, um, you have such a cross-disciplinary focus. You're an artist, you're a writer. I, I don't have any particular you know, set of practices or things that I read consistently or ever beyond kind of detective novels and science fiction. That's always a good start. Yeah, which is a pretty good basis for anything. <laughs> but um, I think more broadly what I do is, is, is I do a lot of practical stuff. Um, I have the supreme kind of privilege and luxury to be able to engage with these technologies pretty much as, you know, however in whichever ways I want. So what usually happens is I find some new interesting piece of technology coming along and I try to make something with it. Mm. That could be just some kind of doodle or sketch. It might end up being an artwork. It, quite commonly, it's like, how can I use this for art? Um, because that's sort of a good question as any, because you immediately start to do things with it that wasn't necessarily the, the creator's intention or the more kind of expected application of it, which always has interesting results, rather than just kind of reading about this thing, like what can you do with it yourself? What was um, the most recent thing you've been tinkering with? Most recent stuff is probably uh, a lot of kind of decentralized technologies, uh, these kind of newer forms of kind of peer-to-peer infrastructures and, and programs and protocols. Before that, it was kind of neural networks uh, and kind of simple machine learning AI stuff, mm. um, which was fiendishly complicated and took me a long time to even get my head around at the start. But at the same time, it was totally possible to do so. As with all the stuff, there's open source versions of these things, there's GitHub repositories, there's instructions, there's tutorials. You can copy and paste this stuff from the internet, and if you spend enough time with it, you, you can understand it, just the same as you can understand anything else. AI is an interesting one, because that feels like 
to me as a, uh, a novice, a noob, one of the hardest things to tinker with. So when you think, okay, I want to experientially learn about this, like what, uh, tell me just a little bit in AI, like what that consists of for you. The first project I did that kind of really, I, I did a lot of kind of nice simple language generation stuff where a lot of this stuff starts where you kind of feed a very basic neural network, a bunch of texts, and then get it to kind of spit out these kind of amusing things that it's learned from. One of the barriers to this is that um, to do like proper stuff, you need really massive computation. Mm. This is why basically machine learning has taken off in the last few years is because you have um, big companies with massive data centers, Amazon, Google, Apple, these people, realizing that to do this stuff, you need to churn through such vast amounts of, well, you first need a huge amount of data in the first place, uh, and then you need a huge amount of processing power to run it on. So it's, it's, it's an expensive business, but you can do these little kind of tinkering toy things. And I was intrigued by the way, um, AI seemed to have this kind of predictive quality that the machine would sort of like, you know, by writing or by seeing something, it would kind of create the future in this way. So, so I made a project called Cloud Index, which um, looked at uh, voting patterns in the UK around Brexit and connected it to the weather in order to generate uh, weather patterns that related to particular electoral outcomes, um, which was sort of a joke on both the predictive quality of these machines, uh, but also on all of our ideas about the kind of chance and unknowability of elections. And that produced really lovely outcomes, but, um, but, I, but I needed help with it because it was my first project. I, uh, I identify very strongly with that experiential learning model. Pre-1800, you have these people who are masters of science, but also are artists and skilled sketchers and are um, involved in the development of optics. It almost feels like one person can master um, enough of the disciplines to be, as you, as you describe it, someone who kind of understands the whole system. And right now it feels incredibly dif difficult to understand the whole system. And your book is a lot about the need for people to understand that whole system. So I wonder how you think designers can participate in that educational process and, and design with that in mind. I know that's not a simple question. I think so. I think there's a, there's a few things going on there. I mean, the, this idea that since sometime in the 18th century it's been possible for one it's been impossible for one person to kind of hold all human knowledge in their head. I mean, I think that was already a fallacy and a very kind of uh, Europeanized one. But but it's definitely true that right now no one can possibly know everything, and in fact, no one can even know everything about about like two or three disciplines within everything. You know, fields are so vast and complex now and, and are composed of such complexly interacting systems that even to have knowledge of that system is not to be able to kind of predict uh, in, with any kind of real validity what will happen when, when that knowledge goes out to play in the world. So yeah, we, we live in this age of kind of vast and, and basically unknowable systems, and yet we have to live in them. What I think about often is just basically how complexity in the world scares people in quite a deep way. I, I trace a lot of our current woes to the fact the world seems too vast to understand for most people. And having already established that we can't understand everything, how do we live within this complex world without going completely crazy? And it's that sense of having agency within a complex system, not, not needing to master it, not needing to control it, but actually being comfortable with, with this kind of uncertainty and complexity. And what I feel like mo at the moment, most design is, is about hiding complexity. It's about making it easier for people to do things, making everything as essentially thoughtless as possible. When what we really, really, really need to do more than anything is like think about this, not to be overwhelmed by it, not to be overcome by it, not to try and solve it, but simply not to sort of panic every time we encounter complexity in various ways. If design can encourage people not just to use things, but to think about and learn from them, then you have a process of education built into that as well. That almost seems like a reversal of some of the design cliches of the last decade, the um, minimalist everything, uh, simplify for the end users. To, to simplify or even to be minimalist in thinking is in some ways to deny complexity. It's to deny complexity, it's to reduce agency, and it's to kind of increase illiteracy. Um, it's, it's to say that like this stuff is too complicated for you to understand, you don't mm. need to think about this, you don't need to worry. Every time something is simplified or, or made easier, something is hidden. And we really, I think we see that so, so strongly in, in so many examples in the present, whether, you know, take an example like you know, delivery or, or kind of ride hailing apps. 
everything is reduced to just like a bu this button on your phone behind a glass screen, requires no thinking about any of the kind of complex social structures, the laws, other people's lives, low paid workers, any of that stuff is outside the scope of this kind of design visualization of the problem. And yeah, I, in I increasingly believe that actually like a really good role for design would be to expose people to higher levels of complexity. The balance is not making it so hard, um, but that, that's design's role, I think, really. What is the first step people c can take to taking control over their own technological lives and perhaps the serenity of their brains in relation to those te technological lives? There's a, a, a comfort level that we have when we have a working mental model of something that means we feel like we have some sense of what's, what's gone wrong when we need to know that. And yeah, and then can have like a more nuanced conversation with other people. There's a difference between knowing how to fix something and having like a working mental model of it. Mm. I would be terrible at fixing the plumbing, but I know basically how it functions, what it's supposed to, particularly I know like danger signs. Um, I know, I can probably figure out when something's wrong, where the problem exists, so that I can communicate with someone who has like a higher technical knowledge in order to fix it. That's the, that's the gap that I think I see in kind of technological knowledges is that there are people who have high skills and do understand these things, and then there's everybody else, yeah. to which they're completely inexplicable, incomprehensible systems. But the, the, the thing that I think upsets people, even like kind of subconsciously, even you know, without us necessarily being aware of it all the time, is this sense of we're constantly relying on things that, that we have no, no sense of their function. Uh, you live in Athens now. You lived in London until a few years ago. How has the change in your geography, um, like, you know, seeing different things every day, seeing a different economic system that you're living within, how has that changed your thinking? I mean, fairly extensively. And, in, in, you know, before I left London in particular, I, I was doing um, a huge amount of work around surveillance and it kind of intensely sensitized myself to it to the point where I was, when I walk around London and other heavily surveilled cities now, I kind of feel it as like kind of prickling on my shoulder blades, which, which thankfully is, is very much not the case in, in Athens for a number of reasons. Um, it's also a very technologically different place. Like it, it feels like a lot of the kind of technological luxuries available to people in North America and Northern Europe really haven't spread beyond that. And, and in part that's because of a certain affluence and, 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 and time pressure and other things, but also it, it is cultural. Um, delivery services and, and a lot of things work in, um, uh, are kind of much more threaded into the mode of society there. Like if you want a coffee, like someone will bring it to you anyway. Like you don't need like all kinds of weird apps and stuff to kind of get into that system. Equally, you know, the first taxi app was for, for the taxis because they have a much different relationship with, with labor unions and this kind of stuff there. So it wasn't something that was um, kind of extracting work out of a, a kind of new lower um, lower paid or lower protected group, but actually came with a certain strength to it. You know, looking back at Europe and looking out elsewhere at, at a very different world, there's this phrase that's been used several times at this conference already, which is the next billion users. How, we, how do we onboard them onto the systems that we have at present? That's, that's not going to be what's going to happen. Uh, the next billion users are going to be very hot and very wet and pretty pissed off and their needs are going to be radically different to the last billion users. And so thinking through what it really means to look outside this kind of, um, this bubble of, of what design's supposed to do, because yeah, our, our current engagement with technology is, is radically unsustainable. And that's really, really obvious when you move outside the, the kind of bubble of North America and Northern Europe. It's also just interesting to do these things in different places. You know, when I did the self-driving car project, I wasn't really thinking so much about what I was doing, or rather I wasn't thinking so much about where I was doing it. But there is something different about building artificial intelligence and, and running it on the road system, not in California or kind of Bavaria, but in Greece, a place with a very different kind of social and material and even mythological history. So when I was testing the self-driving car, I found myself just you know, driving up into the mountains, drive around all these little tracks, and realized I was driving up Mount Parnassus which is the, the home of the muses. Of course, it's the biggest cliche in the world for like kind of posh English guy to go to Greece and discover you know, the, the Greek <laughs> mythology. It's a, it's a rich tradition. It's a rich tradition. Yeah. Um, but, but it also, it has meaning because you're engaging with a different set of stories than you would do if you, would, if you were engaging with the kind of techno-determinist myth 
of Silicon Valley or the kind of industrial myths of, of the German auto industry, uh, you <laughs> just by, by the, 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 the stories that are in the place that you're in, they bring a, a slightly different kind of thought structure behind these things. So that's, that's sort of intensely valuable as well. I really enjoyed your writing about surveillance in Britain. And I wonder how you think about the idea that if you do know, if you do know more about these systems, as you do, having written about it, and now I do, having read your writing, you've almost ruined London a bit for me. <laughs> um, it's, it's difficult. The, the book is, is, is hard work, and it's quite grim. And it doesn't paint a very pretty picture of things. And I, I wrote it in part to kind of get these things not out of, at least through my head and kind of down on paper so that we could just be clear about what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, there are hopeful, I think, aspects within the book. But again, I was, trying, I was really trying not to kind of solutionize or predict or any of those things, really just to straight up just tell a bunch of stories about this is what's happening. Um, and also, this not not this is what's happening in the future, but this is this is what's happening right now. These are the already visible effects of the things that we're building because we're constantly being told that these technologies will kind of produce magic outcomes in the future, uh, and yet they seem to be producing absolutely hideous conditions in the present. And there's no ex reason why that why that why that should change. So we have to be very clear about what the situation is, so that actually we can have have a kind of meaningful discussion about it and yeah in, in places that's that's quite traumatic and difficult but it's 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 a lot better than just ignoring the situation or pretending it's not there I don't think anyone is capable of ignoring the situation it's far more of a kind of like uh, a psychology in which all of that oh, kind of vague awareness is is suppressed and and results in in kind of hideous fear and 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 occasionally kind of anger uh, or kind of at the moment predominantly anger, which seems to be the kind of dominant political tenor of our times. Um, I think I think that's a fairly clear psychological response to a lack of agency and power and an understanding of the world. You write about um, computational thinking and how it leads to the kinds of um, solutionism that you were just describing. I, was, I wonder if you could just sort of talk about what computational thinking is and how it informs a lot of the design that at least presently we see in the world, maybe not in the future, hopefully. So computational thinking is a kind of extension of what other people have called solutionism. Solutionism is the kind of dominant narrative of, of Silicon Valley, but it's kind of spread to a lot of the rest of the world, which is essentially that the issues of the world are technical problems which can be fixed mostly by the application of more technology. That there are, there is kind of one true answer to these problems and by some kind of, you know, evolutionary design critical path, we shall, we shall reach that and, and that we will be able to solve these problems. Computational thinking for me is kind of what happens when that settles deep into the brainstem and we're not even aware that we're thinking that way anymore. So, but we still kind of consider the world as a, as a something to be calculated. So it starts to bring in all these questions, not just solutions with data, but how we see the world as collections of data, how we think we can collect the world as data, that the world is, is meaningful just through kind of collecting information about it. And that there is some kind of sum total of knowledge uh, it, that if only we could gather it all together, everything would sort of magically become clear. It, it, it presumes like a, a fixed input and output, like a fixed process that will come to some kind of resolution. Um, and it's increasingly obvious that that's not the case. Um, the world is not like that. The world is not, much of the world is, is incomputable, but is obscured from view by this belief in kind of computational knowledge with really, really disastrous effects. The, the project then is to kind of look for as I do in the book, to explore the ways in which computational knowledge fails. And then to start thinking about the implications of that, which are that there is no kind of algorithmic solution to the world, which means there is no um, magic future point at which things are going to be solved, which is really important because it returns our attention to the present and actually what we can do in the here and now, uh, how to help and care, rather than, rather than keeping our eye on this, some distant techno fix which will solve this stuff stuff in the future. And I, I find that actually to be incredibly powerful and kind of reorienting um, to actually think about what, you know, what the things that we work on achieve now in the present. What Aldous Huxley always said about um, means defining the ends, right? We, we can't just keep our eyes on this kind of like uh, amazing future that will be kind of ushered in by these things. Rather, we have to pay serious attention to what they're doing now. 
I was, as I was reading um, about your ideas on computational thinking, my brain kept asking, well, what's the opposite of computational thinking? Like, what is the foil in a literary sense for, for this? And the closest I could approximate, um, and I'm interested in whether I've misinterpreted your ideas here, is that chaos and perhaps an acknowledgement of the essential chaos is the opposite of computational thinking? Yeah, I think I think in as much as chaos captures that which cannot be modeled or predicted yeah. in any meaningful way. So in the book, I write quite a lot about uh, Richardson, um, Lewis Fry Richardson, who was a, a meteorologist and pacifist. Uh, he's a really interesting life story, but he's basically the guy who invents weather prediction. Literally, it's, his, his book was called Weather Prediction by Numerical Processes. Yeah. So he's the first person who says that we can calculate the weather, which is the same thing as saying we can calculate the future, right? that we can develop a form of maths that's so powerful that will capture all this data and will tell us what will happen in the future. Um, so I really, I think of, of weather prediction as like the, you know, one of the foundations of computational prediction. Um, but Richardson does a whole bunch of other amazing stuff in his life. And uh, later on, he actually, he tries to apply that to solving conflicts. And he writes a number of books about uh, the mathematical basis bases for war, which he never really kind of resolves because it turns out chaos. Um, but uh, but one of the things he sort of hits on about halfway through, I think it's sort of forties uh, or fifties, halfway through this kind of process, and then doesn't I don't know for me doesn't really grok the consequences of is this thing called the coastline paradox where. It's when he's trying to work out the likelihood of two nations going to war with each other, and he thinks it might be related to the length of their shared border. So he tries to calculate the shared borders between all these places, and he realizes it's impossible to measure borders and coastlines, because it's Zeno's paradox. Like, if you do an approximation, you know, you can say, you know, if you draw this many lines, it's this long. And then he realizes that if you shorten those lines, make it, like, lower the resolution, it gets longer and longer and longer. And it's one of the first intimations of, of, of fractal numbers. And I think Mandelbrot later cited Richardson's work as a kind of early example of this realization of fractals, that it's complexity all the way down, that you increase the resolution and things become more and more complex. There's no, there's no answer to this question. Uh, coastlines are, are, are unmeasurable, are fractal in this sense. And so even just like the, the, the like, it's one of these obviously also where if you like really pay attention to what the maths or the technology is telling you, it's saying you can't do this. Like this is more complex than it's possible. And all of these things that we think of as kind of like failures or bugs of, of computational processes are actually, for me, in this sort of anthropomorphic way, is, is you know, the machinery going like, no, this isn't the way to do this. And the evidence of it is all around us. And we're just sort of refusing to see it. You just described someone as a meteorologist and pacifist, which I think is maybe my favorite like life job description ever. When, when you're on a flight from uh, Athens to here in Helsinki, where we are now, and someone asks um, what, what you do, what do you tell them? Uh, I say I say writer and artist. It covers all of the bases. Covers all the bases. Um, what what's next? Where where does where is your writing and art taking you? I'm I'm super interested in explore, exploring the consequences of um, this particular and potential answer to the problem of the future, uh, which is essentially to um, suggest that it's not where we should be spending our energy and our thought. That we have to think very carefully about the structures that we that we build and inhabit. Uh, in the present, um, how we actually uh, think about and care for everyone around us and ask ourselves constantly at every point, like, am I trying to fix this problem or are I trying to help? That, that to me, seems the axis on, on which so much of this stuff turns rather than kind of uh, concentrating on kind of huge, wild solutions to large problems. Uh, thank you so much for this interview. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Make sure to check out the rest of our series recorded at SPAN 2018 in Helsinki. Guest hosts Aaron Lammer and Amber Bravo spoke with speakers from this year's conference about their work at the intersection of technology and design in the four-part series available now. You can subscribe to Design Notes on Google Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.